Okay. Coop, what are you eating? Fruity Pebbles? Yeah. yeah. Nothing but the finest here. <clears throat> All right. Well, the really good news is that we didn't get the knock of doom on our door last night. So the Walmart parking lot treated us well, right? Yeah, I was a little bit nervous at first. You know, it's hard for me to fall asleep when I hear all these cars driving by thinking, oh, that's going to be the one. There's the cop. Oh, there's security. But we didn't get the knock, so that was good. Um, but then I woke up early and edited yesterday's video. And then um, started getting stuff ready for the day. And I'm wearing my new pants. They still look the same because they're jeans. But since they're Wranglers, I decided to put on my cowboy boots today. So we're booting it with the Wranglers. But, um... All right. Well, I'll finish getting ready, and then we'll see where we're next on this video. Yep. Yep. All right, folks. We're 35 feet underground, level two of the complex. You guys are in the access portal. The walls of the access portal are only one foot thick, so it's not designed to withstand a nearby detonation. It's all going to cave in on itself. It's your way in, it's your way out. This is where the hardened part of the structure begins. Four feet of concrete on all the walls. Floors and ceilings are five feet thick. The top 30 feet of that saddle out there is eight feet thick of concrete just to hold the weight of that massive door. The entire complex is covered in a quarter inch of battleship grade steel. It acts as a Faraday cage. All of our doors are one foot thick steel I beams, double welded together. They mill the surface of the doors, the frames, and there's neoprene seals. So when these doors are closed, and these doors are always closed, it's virtually airtight in here. This is designed to protect you from the first strike, a near miss. Protect you from the radiation, the blast wave, the heat wave, and the electromagnetic pulse, which is a pulse of energy shoots out of the speed of light, destroying anything with electronics in it. No more video games, television, telephones, automobiles, electricity, period. The world is back in the dark ages, if and when this ever happens. This is going to protect you from all of that, as long as the bomb the Soviets have aimed at us misses us by more than a mile. If they can land a ground burst within a mile of us, this entire complex will be instantly vaporized. Nothing can withstand the force of one of these bombs. The last thing a crew needs to worry about down here is a shock wave. A nearby detonation is going to create this incredible earthquake. It's going to make the land above our heads look like waves on the ocean. We need to survive that. Everything critical to launch in this missile, all the people, all the equipment, and the missile itself, while on giant springs and shock absorbers. Shock isolation, you'll see it everywhere down here, including all three floors of this building. <coughs> we crossed a bridge to get into this room. We're not attached to the walls. We're just hanging here by eight of these massive springs around the room. So in case of that shock wave, the ground around us and the shell of the building itself can all bounce up and down a foot and a half, a foot side to side. We should just hang here safe in our little cocoon. There's four crew members, two officers, two enlisted people. We're here for the next 24 hours. That's our shift. We call it an alert. It's our job while we're down here to decode secret messages, monitor and maintain the missile in the complex, troubleshoot any problems that may arise, keep this place in a state of readiness. Today, America's up to DEFCON 3, which is like a yellow light. Europe's already up to DEFCON 2. DEFCON 1 means imminent nuclear war. We're more than halfway there right now. Last 10 minutes of every meeting, they would show us movies. They smuggled out of the Soviet Union of them launching and detonating their newest nuclear weapons. Kind of put us in the mood for work that day. Jump in our trucks, drive out to the silos, replace the crews that were there for 24 hours. They take our truck, they drive back to the base, and we sail ourselves in for 24. First thing we need to do, we need to check everything here. We go through this place with a fine tooth. It could be a simulated launch, it could be the real deal. You don't know, they all sound exactly the same. So until we get the message, write it down and then decode it, we're not sure what's going on. But crews are trained to believe, when you hear this message you're about to hear, it means it could be World War III, you better bang on it, drop your door, get to the control center, and decode that message. First thought goes through a 19 year old kid's head when that thing goes off. Oh my God, this is it. Every time that thing goes off, you jump right out of your skin and your first thought is, this is it. I won't kid you, it can be an incredibly boring job at times. There's four of us down here for 24 hours staring at each other, just sitting here waiting for an order to come through that speaker to tell us in the world and hoping we never ever get it. But the boredom is punctuated by moments of sheer terror every time this thing goes off. Preamble to an emergency.
emergency action message. All your radios are going off. Captain has a top secret emergency action message book. So does our deputy. Crack it open. There's a foreman here and they each have a grease pencil. They're going to read off a 41 character message. You're both going to copy it down in your books. Then you exchange your books, they repeat the message, and you copy it down again. Then you put the two books together, and you make sure you copy down the same exact thing. When it comes to nuclear weapons in America, two people have to do, agree to do anything. Not even the president, thank God, run off and make some crazy launch order. People have to agree with them. It's part of America's checks and balances. Unfortunately for us today, I guarantee this is the message that no crew member ever wanted to receive. It's the real deal. We've been ordered to launch. We can only get that launch order from two places. The president, and if he's dead, the doomsday plane. We have to make sure it came from one of those two sources. We need to authenticate this message. This now allows us to go into that red safe right there. That's our emergency war order safe route. Go to war safe. One of the most top secret documents in America used to be held in that safe. It's called the PSYOPs, our nuclear battle plan. The battle plans for every nuclear weapon America possessed and what to do with them was held in that safe. That book is incredibly top secret. It was the most top secret thing about this place. It's still top secret to this day. We got in that book with our lives. We're pulling that book out of there. We're taking out 24 of these authenticator cards that were kept in there. Choosing the one that corresponds with the first two characters of that message. Say it's this one, Lima 5. These were made out of hot plastic. We called it the cookie. Crack open the cookie. Pull out the authenticator card. You ever hear of the nuclear football? The officer that follows around the president 24 hours a day with a briefcase handcuffed to him with the launch codes in it? This is what's in there. These are the launch codes. You're going to line this up with both your books. You're going to make sure it lines up exactly. If it does, if you agree, it's authenticated, it came from the president, we've been ordered to launch. Message itself is going to tell us what page in that PSYOP book to go to. What battle are we fighting? There's all different scenarios in that book based on what they think the Soviets have already launched at us. We're going to that plan. It's going to tell you what time to launch. You take your crayon, write the time in big numbers across the face of your clock, so we don't make a mistake. This is synchronized to the second. There are 54 tiny dudes about to fly over the North Pole. There are a thousand Minutemen missiles going over the North Pole. All our nuclear submarines are firing off all their missiles, and all our nuclear bombers are getting airborne, and they're flying over the North Pole. It all can't go at the same time. It has to go exactly when it has to go, and that's why your clock has to be so accurate. Captain, the message is going to tell you which of our three pre-programmed targets you're aiming at. You punch it in right there. And it's going to give you the combination of the butterfly valve for the first time ever. You're going to read it off to me. I'll enter the combination here, break the seal, flip this up, hit that switch. If I get a green light, they gave me a good code, butterfly valves are unlocked, and we're about to launch. Now we know a couple other things at this point. We know if we've been ordered to launch by the president, that we have completely, utterly, miserably failed at our job. Our goal was peace. Our mission, peace through deterrence. America's blown it. There's no more deterrence. There's no more peace. We're already at war. The Soviets have already launched. There's going to be nuclear weapons raining down on American cities within minutes. Folks, it only takes 30 minutes for a nuclear missile to reach America from Russia. That's it. Any moment of any day. When at this very moment, there are over 1,500 active nuclear missiles, never more than 30 minutes away from killing all of us. In that 30-minute flight, NORAD, North American Air Defense, has to spot those launches on their radar. They need to take the time to... Verify that they're actual missiles and not some glitch or mistake which happens. Then you've got to get the President, Joint Chief of Staff, Head of Security Council up in the sky where they're safe, and they have to figure out what's going on. What are the Soviets done? What are they launched at us? What are we going to do? How do we retaliate? What battle are we fighting? Break open the football. Send out the Coast to Strategic Air Command, the Doomsday Plan, the 15th Air Force, and they need to broadcast out of all the radios, the launch codes, the Titan Twos, the Minutemen, the B-52s, and the nuclear submarines. That's going to take them 20 to 25 minutes to figure all that stuff out, at least before we even receive a message, which gives us a five-minute warning, which gives us five minutes to launch, which gives us five minutes left to live, Captain. We're the first target. They don't want that thing going back, taking out an entire city. They're trying to catch us napping. They're trying to catch these things still in the silo. We're not going to let that happen. We're launching. Are you ready? All right. Here we go. Where do we launch missiles in America with big red buttons? Hollywood folks. 
<laughs> television. Every movie you ever see, somebody's hitting a big red button. I don't know where they get that from because these two big red buttons just tell us the doors are open, that's all. <laughs> in the real world, we use keys. There's a set of keys in that safe. Captain, your key goes here. Deputy, your key goes over there. The keys are angled. They're seven and a half feet apart, so one person can't reach both. Spring loaded to the off position, just like the ignition in your car. You can't turn one and go get the other. They have to go at the same exact time. So are you ready now? Put your left hand on the keys. Don't turn it. Stand up, put your left hand on the keys. Captain, you're the boss. You're going to give your deputy a countdown. Three, two, one, launch. On launch, you're going to turn them clockwise and you're going to hold them until I tell you to let them go. Three, two, one. Turn it. Turn it. And hold it. You can let go. You did your job. You did what the Air Force paid you to do. You just joined World War Three. Square miles is a city 30 miles across. That's my city. That's your city. That's any city. Beijing, Moscow, Washington, LA, New York, London, Paris, Berlin. You name it, it's gone. Instantly. Whoever lived there, they're gone. And then for miles and miles beyond that, fires are raging, homes are burning, people are igniting. This is a devastating, devastating weapon. Earth has never seen anything like that thing before. It's what America thought we needed to keep the peace, to keep the Soviets from starting World War III, to keep them at bay. The good news, no one ever got a message or turned a key. The simplest plan you can possibly imagine what keeps you alive is called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. Told you, there's 1,500 words aimed at us just from Russia. We have 1,500 aimed right back at them. There's no way anyone can possibly win a nuclear war. Everybody knows it. So our man says that if everybody knows they can't win it, no one will ever try. Yeah, every one of these is a spring holding us from the ceiling. All right, folks, you're looking at the second stage of the Titan II. Up above the black box and reentry vehicle, just like the one in the gift shop, that's where your warhead would sit. That's the only part of this rocket that's going to reach its time. The rest is just to get it going. Look, okay, everything's, everything's hung from springs for the shock. More, more springs, that's crazy. Yeah. So this is where we were. We came in down the stairs. We went to the control our control room. Above was their bunks and kitchen. I don't know what that was. We saw this room, and then we walked back through the hallways. And we were on this this level here, seeing this part of the missile. Pretty cool. Bailey's Navigator today. So we just left the Titan Missile Museum. What did you think? Uh, it was pretty cool. The, but, uh, tell us some interesting things you remember. Well, so our navigation systems were really well, good, so we didn't need that much nuclear power, even though it's still a lot. But the Russians, they, their navigation was garbage, so they just loaded it with a bunch of nuclear stuff. So it was like 20 tons. What was it like? Well, ours, our warheads were nine megatons, which they said was the equivalent of nine thousand tons of TNT. Uh, because we were more accurate, that was fine for us. But the Russians' navigation systems were crap, so they put a twenty megaton warhead on. So it was the equivalent of twenty thousand pounds uh, or twenty thousand tons of TNT. Yeah. So the hole it made would be a mile wide and five hundred feet deep. Yeah. Um, yeah, because so, they, they weren't as accurate, so they said, well, we'll get close enough. We'll just put a bigger bomb on the top. Yeah, they were it would be annihilated. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was pretty cool. And the guy, the docent that we had, the guy giving the tour, I was telling the kids, what was pretty cool about him was he actually worked at one of these facilities. There's 18 out here in Arizona, and he was at a different one. But he was actually 19 years old in the Air Force back in the 60s, working this... Uh, 24-hour shifts. 24-hour shifts. Um, so it's cool because normally if you get a tour guide, they're just old people or random people that kind of know about it, but they didn't really do it. But he actually lived it for a couple years. He was the one working it. So that was a really a nice treat was having that kind of a guy teaching us because he knew everything about it. Okay, Miss Bailey, we learned, we remembered some more facts we want to talk about. Yeah, our missile, when it explodes, it would be 30 miles by 30 miles with 7,000 7, mile per hour winds. Yeah, so, so uh, 900 yeah. square miles. Any, big enough for any major city. That's what we talked about was, we figured nine megatons was all we needed. We didn't need to launch 20. Nine was plenty. Uh, and they said they would detonate it, remember how high in the air? Uh, 14,000 feet. So at 14,000 feet, they would detonate it, and then that's what would cause, like it seems kind of high, but that's how they they got the mass maximum destruction was at that altitude. So pretty crazy. Here's video proof. Work. School work, Monday. Boys, you working? Yeah. Doing school work? Yeah. What are you working on? Miss Bailey, yeah. where do we know this airplane from? Uh, the Oshkosh Air Show. From our last trip, huh? Yeah, we toured it and saw everything inside. It was an eye hospital for like underdeveloped countries. Yeah. And countries yeah. that can't afford eye surgery. That's right. I don't know what video it was on our last video, last trip, I mean, but inside of here, this is the old one. We toured the newer one. They have uh, surgery centers in here so they would fly to these countries and then have a whole line of people that needed eye surgeries. It was pretty cool. We're at the uh, Pima Air and Space Museum. We have like 400 airplanes here. Cooper, what do you got to tell me about this stuff? That plane over there has eight machine, gun, eight machine guns on its nose. Oh yeah it does. Yeah. What else? And that is a C-130. Oh yeah. Everybody knows what the C-130 is. Alright. Let's see what else we can find today. Oh yeah. After a lot of we can just... We're in the big plane section. Okay bud. What's cool about this plane? First, it has a camera in the front on the oh, nose. For spying, yeah. And second, it has a propeller on each side and a jet engine, too. Yeah. Propeller, jet, that would open up and they could activate it when needed. It's like a hair show out here. That thing needs some help. Bailey, what do you got to tell us? So, that plane over there has this big radar dome for like finding um, the enemies. Yeah, and stuff. good guys, bad guys, everything. Submarines, boats, everything probably. That thing is crazy looking. And then that plane over there has two sets of uh, propellers that spin opposite directions. Yeah, that thing's cr it looks It looks kind of like a big guppy. Oh, and look at, I didn't even notice. Look at the big radar thing on the belly of it. Yeah. Huh, that thing's crazy. And then that uh, plane over there is the first uh, operational jet bomber yeah. that we had. B-47. And way in the distance is the um, 
It's the... <laughs> <laughs> It's the B-36. Yeah. But what is the saying that Jameson loves? Six turning and four burning. Yeah, you know it's a good museum when they have those. There's only a couple of these in, at museums in the country. The B-36, Peacemaker. Okay, here's the uh, B-36 for scale. Size-wise, you can see three knuckleheads over there. This plane is massive. Pretty big radar belly on that one, too. Cooper? Yes, we're down here. Oh, wait, oh, there he is. What's <laughs> um, up? So this plane, the big top thing opens so they can fit big stuff for where they need to bring it. Yeah, they could, they had big rocket parts or just anything huge they needed to ship somewhere. They put it in that. It looks kind of silly, huh? Mr. Jameson, what can you tell me about these other planes over here? So, that little gray plane up there um, would have like troops in it and would be pulled by like a big plane like the one below it and there would be a string of them with a bunch of them on so it. So like, there's no motor on that one, right? It's a glider. Yeah, it's a glider. Yeah. And they would be pulled and they would land where the troops need to go. Yeah, so they'd have uh, parachute dudes here and then those were gliders that they would be towed in. Interesting idea, and they did it. Okay, Bailey, we're at a secret destination and advertising works because we're here because of how many billboards did we see on the freeway? About like 15 or 20. Yeah, serious bucks on billboards. And we said, and they were big yellow, they actually look like this down here. The thing, the billboards would say like that. And then they said, you know, all kinds of cliffhangers. And we said, holy shit, we need, to, we need to find out what the thing is. And then we asked the lady, and she said they have billboards from Texas to California. Yeah. So that also, I told the kids, that means that everything in this store is way overpriced to pay for billboard costs. But stay tuned. We're going to find if we are not alone in the universe. This is the 1849 version of our Tioga. What if you had to take it across the country on a road trip, Cooper? What do you think? This would probably break nowadays because the <laughs> yeah. bumps on the road and stuff. Yeah. Um, Look at there's zero really suspension. Old. Yeah. Wooden wheels. Um, and instead of uh, 300 horsepower, we have two oxen power. I don't know, man. One oxen power. Bailey, do you think Uncle Josh would like this place? No. <laughs> no? He'd be pretty, he'd be like, but what if this is the government trying to make us believe that there oh. is an outer space, thinking that there's not an yeah, outer space. Yeah, a diversion. <laughs> but aside from a diversion, this is this is aligning with Uncle Josh's. Look at, they got lizard people, the all-seeing eye, Bigfoot, Loch Ness. They talk about all of life's conspiracies in this building. I think Uncle Josh would like this place. So this is the thing. Mummified remains. Supposedly it's real. They said it was found in the copper mines of Arizona here. All Bailey saw, she said, it's a hat. I said, yes, Bailey, it's a hat covering his private parts. And she said, oh, I didn't even see the person there. I'm dealing with geniuses. Help me. All right, we made it out of the thing. What are your guys' thoughts? 
pretty good. good. It was pretty, yeah. It was uh, worth a couple bucks, ten bucks for the family. Um, you think Coop good? Yeah. Bailey, you thought it was very truthful? Yeah. A lot of head scratching things, huh? Maybe aliens have been playing with our history. Yeah. And manipulating the courses of events. Or maybe they just like to ride dinosaurs. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's a lot of dinosaurs. Yeah, there was. Okay, this message is for Senor Toby. Or Vecino. Thank All right. you, Toby. What is that? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our friend Toby gave each of the kids a little bit of dinero for the trip because they know Dad's cheap. So we're at this store that sells wonders of the world, Toby. And Jameson decided to get... Um, a firework grenade. Which a looks firework cool. grenade. Don't tell Mom. Yeah. <laughs> and you and Co Cooper and Jameson split this. Yeah, it's a bag of magnetic rocks. Which... Magnetic rocks. Yeah. Okay, that's what the boys, that's what lit their imagination and tickled their fancy. And then Cooper? I got um, six soda cans that are fizzy candy. Fizzy candies. And one of these. Two. And one of the grenades. <laughs> Bailey has chosen to uh, save her money for, you know, future possibilities. Somewhere. Yeah. So thank you, Toby. You've made the boys so excited. Yes. And uh, we appreciate you. Okay, we're back in the motorhome. We got a, we skipped a step in our trip here. So we just finished the thing. But I forgot to ask the kids, interview them a little bit. We just, we, before this, we left the uh, Pima Air and Space Museum. Uh, Dad's favorite thing was? A10. The A10. They had one and a half of those. <laughs> yeah, one and a half. Uh, but that's dad's favorite thing. There was a couple other dad's favorite things. They had the P-39s, the P-63s, the all kinds of whatever. Dad loves airplanes. Bailey, what, did, what was a couple of things? Because we saw a lot of stuff. We were there for maybe three, three and a half hours. Um, yeah. I like that plane with the big bubble on top that was supposed to open. The one that looked really weird. Oh, where you could stick like cargo stuff yeah. in there? The big beluga looking one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does it look kind of weird? Yeah. And I like that yellow helicopter because it kind of looked like a cartoon from some angles. You're right, that banana-looking helicopter, yeah. yeah. And they had all the windows painted um, to keep the heat out. They're like It's like reflective paint, so the stuff inside doesn't cook during the summers. What about you, Coop? What were a couple of things that you liked at that airport museum? Um, there's a helicopter where the back opens and then you like put you can put people and stuff in mm -hmm. it was that the one with the two rotor blades up top yeah yeah those are um, pretty cool and also the six turning and four burning oh I yeah what the old b36 that plane is massive we've seen that on the last uh the last trip we were at a museum that had that um what about you bud so i like the the things that you could go in like the front ends of the planes, Cockpits. like the cockpits yeah. that you could crawl in and stuff and do all the buttons. And I also like all the big planes, like the B-36 and all the other cargo ones. Yeah, there's some huge cargo planes, huh? Yeah, just yeah. The big ones. Yeah, big stuff. That's cool. And here's a, a side note that, yeah, we're doing homework here. It's Monday. We played all day today at the two museums, so we've been driving doing homework. So, um, all right, well, it's time for Dad to make dinner. And maybe you guys will fill out some postcards. And uh, Dad's going to be driving for a little bit more after dinner. Yep. Okay. We're getting some Shell V Power Nitro Plus. I don't think they put that fancy stuff in my regular... Anyways, so we filled up again just now. We were down to a quarter tank, so we filled up. We got uh, 30, basically 39 gallons. We drove 300 miles, 305. This is Bailey's math here, so I double checked it. It's good. So how many MPGs did we get? 7.82. 7.82. So not quite as good as last time was like 8 point something, but still better than 7, which was our average last trip. And we're actually, we're, uh, we've been going up and down to like three to 4,000 and back down to three. We're up into 4,000 elevation now. So we got some climbing up into going towards New Mexico. So maybe on the backside we'll get even better. But I'm pretty happy with 7.82. Not too bad. And we had plenty of power. 
Okay.